We are live. All right, so for those of you who are going to join this experiment live in progress, Jay and I are going to attempt to record the Music Biz Weekly podcast live and using what we hope is a new feature in Facebook Live that allows you to add guests to you. Geez, there's already five people watching us. Eight people. You're, you're, you're watching us try something we've never done before, people. All right. All right, Jay, I see. Uh, this is already different. So, Jay, I see you. And, and by the way, everybody, Music Biz Weekly Podcast, you're watching this live. Jay is on Skype right now, but he will be coming in live on Facebook. We are brought to you by HypeBot.com. We tried, we tried this initially using the Facebook Pages app, and it wouldn't work in the Pages app. So it appears that this is only in the, the Facebook app right now. When I'm broadcasting live right now, when I see the live viewers, I swipe left and I see who's viewing me live, I'll see their pictures, and on their pictures there's a little green camera icon if they can go live with me. So I see four or three or four people that have the potential to go live. I click on J and it says invite to broadcast. Yes, to broadcast. And then you invite J. Yeah, on my end I see it. There's a little um, indicator that's got your picture that says inviting and it's flashing. Inviting, inviting, inviting. Almost like it's ringing you. Okay. Connecting. There we go. Whoa! Awesome. How's that? Getting the center here? Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. We're live. This is freaking amazing. Yay! I, I, I am live in Sausalito. And I'm live in Los Angeles. There you go. And, 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 and we're recording this on Skype at the same time. So... Um, we've got 14 people viewing us right now. I'm going to swipe that. And, uh, hey, Stephen. Um, all right, so we're going to do a live recording here. And uh, we have no special guest today because basically what we were attempting to do is the um, play with this Facebook Live app and, and, and its work. So... Definitely, as I said, it appears this only works in the Facebook app itself, not the Pages Manager app, because there's a separate app that you can have if you manage Facebook pages. Um, the feature didn't work there. So, um, super cool. Somebody, Sarah Nicole said, hi, uncle. Ah, hi, Sarah. Is that, is that, I was going to say, it's, I'm not her uncle. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's for me. <laughs> All right, so today's topic, um, you were at the Music Biz Association Conference last week in Nashville. Yeah. yeah. How about giving us, uh, you know, 10, 15 A live minutes. look? A recap. What, what, what was interesting? What'd you learn? What'd you see? What'd you do? Yeah, let's, let's talk about, it, it's called the Music Biz um, Association, Music Biz Association. And it used to be called NARM, National Association of Recording Merchandisers. And you and I had Jim Donio on prior to talk about it and tell us kind of the history. So for those who are curious, you may want to go back and uh, watch that podcast. It'll, it'll give you kind of a sense of the history um, behind uh, the convention. I think this was my 20th. I went back and, and looked, and I think, I think that was about my 20th uh, convention. It used to be in different cities every year. It used to be very large. I mean, you would have some top artists play there. You would have all of the record companies. You would have you know, all of the retailers. Back in the day, it was Musicland, Camelot, Sam Goody. When the industry was flush with cash. Yeah. Yeah. When it was flush with cash and, you know, back in, I think 1999 was about the peak of the CD era. And, you know, it was a big, big deal. They would have these extravagant parties and they would have, you know, these great panels. And 
So over the years, it started to decline with the de decline of the CD. And the last few years, it's had a resurgence, resurgence as the digital, you know, downloads, as streaming took off. And I think James Donio did a very good job of transitioning the conference from physical to digital to streaming. But he didn't leave retail out of the picture. And I think that's key to note that somehow he made this convention applicable to all outlets of music. For example, there was a panel that we went to for independent retail and it had some really smart people on there, Terry Courier from Music Millennium, I'm wearing the shirt today, um, some really great people. And they talked about some of the challenges working uh, indie retail and some of the things that you might not think about were you know, what happens if Chance the Rapper puts out a release that's digital only? Well, then there still are independent retailers around the country. The customers will go in saying, hey, I heard this Chance the Rapper on the radio or on Spotify or on television or whatever. Do you have it? Well, now they're kind of screwed because they don't have it and they're not going to get it. Um, and that harms independent retail and independent retail is what brought a lot of these artists, you know, fame and fortune. So that was one of the big complaints. And I think it's a valid one. The other one is some of these. Did, releases. Did, they, did they, did they talk about how they could potentially solve that? Yeah. They, they, they asked the record companies and distributors and managers that were in the house like, look, you guys, you know, if you're going to make something available, don't forget indie retail. Um, make it available on vinyl. Our customers love vinyl. Make it available on CD, even if it's a, a, a window. You know, make sure that you don't forget about because you're leaving money on the table. If you just want to get down to, you know, the commercialism, it's important that you don't leave some customers out because what indie retail mentioned and i think it's very true is that if a customer comes in looking for a release and it's not there chances are they're not going to come back um, when it is available they'll have moved on to something else so that kind of brings up the point of well, what happens when you put out a release quickly you drop a release we've all seen this right michael yep. you know where artists will drop a release boom it's, it's there. Well, that kind of screws indie retail too, because now they're playing catch up. Um, you may have dropped the release and you may even have it coming out on CD, but chances are it's not available on that day for the indie retailers on CD. And even if it is available and they get it to them quickly, uh, day and date, typically there'll be a vinyl counterpart and the vinyl won't, you know, you can't make vinyl in, in a week like you can CDs. It takes months to, because of capacity at the, uh, you know, well, the pressing yeah, plant. And, and that's, that's an interesting point because, um, you know, obviously a lot of people watching this just on my personal page are big music fans and big vinyl fans. And yeah, there's been a resurgence in vinyl. Um, but what you don't understand, and unless you are on the other side and, I've had clients who wanted to make and release vinyl. Sometimes you have to get the material to the vinyl pressing plant six months. That's right. Six months before mm -hmm. your street date. If you want to have vinyl available the day your CD and digital is released, because the backlog to produce vinyl is so huge right now. That's right. And, and, and let's be honest, Six months before a street date, a lot of artists aren't even done recording. <laughs> so, yeah, most. So you, yeah, mo mo most aren't done recording. So how do you That's get right. material out to a, a, a plant to produce, you know, the vinyl? Pro you can't. So that's why a lot of times vinyl is going to be three months down the road after release. May not even happen just because cost involved to produce it. And the time, the lead time just makes it, listen, you know, a lot of albums have three-month lifespans. And 
Sadly. The vinyl doesn't show up for six months. Well, your album was dead three months ago. Yeah. And there's just very it's few places to press vinyl anymore. You know, um, it's supply and demand, you know, and when you have very few pressing plants and you have a lot of demand still for vinyl, um, it, you're right. It's, it's a challenge and you need to plan ahead. But when you drop something quickly and there's not a lot of planning with independent retail in mind, I think that harms them, especially when you put out something that they can't sell. They can't sell streams or downloads at most of these independent retailers, right? So it's people tend to forget about retail because they think that, well, Tower Records is gone, Warehouse is gone. Sure, there's Amoeba and there's Music Millennium and there's some really great indies, but they tend to overlook that. And I think that there's a more robust independent music business than most people believe. Yeah, you know, I've, I've sort of always felt that as unfortunate as it is that the, the big chains have disappeared, the towers of the world, the music lands of the world, that opens up the opportunity for mom and pops to step in. Where, where the big chains, when they were thriving, were destroying mom and pops. Mm. Now that those big chains are gone, there's, there's an opportunity in towns to have a mom and pop mm. record store. Yeah. Yeah, and mom and pops are, or independent retail, whatever you want to call them, they're, they're really important because right now there's about 50 million tracks on Spotify and Apple Music, roughly, and they're adding a million a month. Now think about that for a second. There's no way you can get through all of that. And we always joke around that it's not the information age, it's the recommendation age. Well, we all know what a search engine is and we know what recommendation is. That's what those clerks at those record stores, I mean, I worked four years for an indie, I worked four years for Tower Records, and independent retail will echo this sentiment that you, you have people that come in and say, hey, um, I love this band, can you tell me somebody else that I would like? You know, like the movie uh, High Fidelity. And that you'll give them three albums and they'll buy them and then they'll come back the next week and go, those were really great. You know, what else do you have that's like this? Or I like John Coltrane. What else would I like? You know, those types of things that we haven't really gotten there yet in streaming. I think we're headed that way. I think that Pandora does some really cool things. I think, you know, Spotify with Discover Weekly, Release Radar, you know, some of these things are really taking leaps and bounds. I think some of the recommendations at Apple are really good and Napster, but we're not there yet. And your independent retailer, man, that's, they've got it down because it's a human being. Exactly. Exactly. They know, they know their customers. They know their, their town. They know their region, you know. They know that if this is a rock town versus a pop town versus a rap town, whatever, you know, they, they know what their clients are going to want. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really interesting. You know, the, the indie re uh, retail side of it that I think some people kind of forget about the first day of the convention were back to back workshops from Apple music, Spotify, Pandora, um, YouTube slash, you know, Google, um, and those workshops were fantastic. Um, they, a lot of them talk about insights and you and I have talked about this many times on the show and will continue to, if you're an artist, you need to make sure that you're looking at your data, whether it's, you know, fan insights on Spotify, whether it's amp on Pandora, you know, whatever it is, you need to go in and look at your data because there's so much you can learn. And now you can do things like with Spotify that you couldn't do before. For example, you can go in and change your image or, you know, some things that were maybe a little bit more challenging in the past. So I encourage you to do that. I think this was the first big meeting that I've seen the Spotify exe executives attend. And I think that it was a challenge for them in, in some ways. I think they have a lot to tout and a lot, uh, a lot of great things that are going on. But the common buzz around the room was that they wanted to find out more about 
um, the different paths that it takes to get onto a playlist. And um, a friend of mine raised his hand and asked the question, like, what are the metrics that you look at when you try to choose a song uh, to go on different playlists? And he was kind of blown off. And the, the answer was, well, that's proprietary. Okay. Another person raised their hand and said, look, I've got a world music label. I've got some really great stuff. It would fit on some of your playlists really well. You know, what can I do to get this in front of your editors? And again, the answer was, well, you know, you need to be active on socials. So um, that was probably the frustrating part because I think with Spotify, they're growing and they're changing and they're starting to actually, at least with some of the majors and some of the major indies, you know, like the ADAs, Carolines, you know, Ingroove, some of those folks, they're starting to open up and give direct access to some of the editor curators. And the problem with that, as you can imagine, is you've got, you know, thousands of people trying to reach out to one person. Well, as, as you just said, what, a million tracks a month getting dumped into that pool. Now, we're not saying every single one of those artists has any interest in, in promoting it because most, most of them just release it and forget it. Yeah. But you're right. You know, you can't, when you've got one playlist editor, how does that one playlist editor deal with the deluge of thousands yeah. of bands and labels trying to um, get their attention? That's right. They have, I wrote this down when, during the meeting, they have 4,500 human curated playlists by 90 editors worldwide. 90, so, and this is Spotify? Mm -hmm. So that's 90 people managing all of the playlists on Spotify, the playlist that Spotify creates. That's, Curious, that's, yeah. that's not, let's not confuse that with the playlist that any one of us can create. They have no impact on that. That's or all. even the algorithm-based ones like a right. Discover Weekly. The Discover Weekly. But, but yeah, so, you know, that's, 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 that's terrible news to hear that, actually. Well, if you think about it, I mean, how could any service, you know, have that enough manpower, you know, to do that? Um, one of the stats that I wrote down, which I thought was really interesting, is Discover Weekly um has had five billion streams wow and you and i have talked about how important that playlist is i, I use that playlist every week yeah i do too i do too and and what i've noticed with discover weekly just with some of the artists that i work with is sometimes they'll i can see they're getting tested in there they're not you know that's the great thing about discover weekly it's the different playlist my discover weekly is different than yours right and yours is different than somebody else's. So you can see that some of your artists are being tested at a smaller level in those playlists. And, and, and again, that's to see how are the streams? Are people playing it? Number two, are people adding it to their personal playlists? And number three, are people skipping it? Those are you know, some key metrics that they look at. But I think one of the questions that came up at the workshop was, other than those metrics, what else can I do to show Spotify that this is an important track. Is it radio airplay? Is it driving traffic? You know, is it participating in your marketing programs or doing sessions? I mean, those are some of the things. And it's, it's hard for Spotify because, again, you would have to have 10,000 employees to, you know, work with every single artist and every single label and, you know, for every release that comes out every month. So it's, it's definitely a challenge for them right now. Hey, you know, I, we, we, we've got comments coming in and there's a good question here. Sure. Uh, I think, you know, this person, Bruce Ellaby. Yeah. Um, so Bruce asked, so getting your playlist in front of someone at Spotify is equal to getting your demo heard by an A&R person back in the old days. That's his question. And, and actually what I would equate it to is it's more like getting your song added to the playlist at your local top 40 radio station or rock station, the commercial, the big commercial station. Yeah. It's not necessarily an A&R person. It's 
I mean, it's, it's very equivalent to the, the gatekeepers at radio were the music directors and the program directors. Yeah. But yeah, you because, had, you know, you had, one, you had one or two people at, a, at a, this is in the old days. Mm -hmm. You had one or two people at each radio station who were the gatekeepers of deciding what music gets added to the station's playlist. And you had to deal with that one person every week to try and get them to officially add you. Spotify is the new radio. And Spotify has all of these playlists that they create, a rock playlist, a metal playlist, playlists around different moods, you name it, every genre, every style, what would you say? 4,000 playlists. And, and that's just they, the human curated ones. Those are the human curated ones. So they've got 90 gatekeepers that decide what songs get added into rotation, basically. Yeah, there's actually, it's a little more complicated than that. There, there's, there are multiple levels. You're talking about the level of the curator um, editor. Okay, right. and that that's one level. But above that, there's another level of genre based editors and advisors. And then above that, you know, there are label and distribution reps that, you know, kind of filter through some of these and work with uh, these artists and managers, for example, Spotify, and we're using Spotify as an example here. There's, you know, Napster and Apple Music and, you know, all sorts of other things. But for this particular example, they want, you know, Troy Carter said they don't necessarily want exclusives anymore. And I think Apple's kind of going away from exclusives as well. But they also want to get involved early on in the process. They want to hear early mixes. And I'm talking about top artists now, not new developing artists. So there are multiple levels of engagement with somebody like Spotify, whether it's, you know, depending on the level of who the artist is. If you're the Chainsmokers, Drake, Chance the Rapper, you know, you'll probably have a lot better uh, time meeting with them, playing them new music, getting them in the studio, getting them out to see your band play and so on. It's more challenging when you're a little bit further down the food chain and you're a new developing artist. Right. And, and that's, you know, we've talked about this in, in many episodes. That is the challenge. If, if you're not a major artist, major management, major record label, those basically have direct ends to these, these, these people at the streaming services. Sure, sure. To, to make the case to pitch their new release coming down the road. But if you're the unknown band releasing your CD because this is your first project, but it's actually really good, how do you get yourself heard? That's, that's, that's what we've been asking and trying to figure out for for years here is how do, how do you break through that? You know, in, again, in the old radio model, you could hire radio promoters. You could hire somebody who has connections with the radio stations who would go knock on the doors, pick up the phone, pitch your music and try and get you at it. That was all they did. That doesn't, I'm basically saying that doesn't exist. Yeah, there's a couple there's a couple businesses out there that are trying to yeah. do that, but you it's not I, there. You it's it's not there. It's mm -hmm. not there. There isn't there isn't anybody who can sit here with any certainty and say, yeah, I can I can take your music and I can pitch it and I can make sure it's heard. I can't. They'll never be able to promise getting anything added. No. You know, and, and any anybody who ever approaches you and says, I. I can guarantee you I'll get you added, leave. Because they, they can't guarantee it. No. What they, they can probably guarantee is it'll at least get listened to or considered. But how does the small artist who doesn't have a deep pocket, unlimited budget do that? Yeah, that's and there's, that, there's a that, lot that, of And that's, paths, what, that's what these right? people sound like they're asking is how do we do right. this? Yeah, and, and the truth of the matter right now is that there are multiple paths. There, it, it, there's not just one way to do it. P I've seen success with people who have built up their socials, you know, people who are driving traffic, you know, and they're advertising with uh, a DSP in their ads, like stream my music here, download it here. 
those those things can work for you. But again, there's different paths for different artists. But, Knowing but, but, some but of let, the... me, let me let me just you know, and what you said is is what everybody should do and and make sense. But that's ne that's you hoping that you're doing everything right and that they discover you. Yeah, but it's also part of a larger menu, right? And what I mean by that is you, it's basic blocking and tackling. So you do build up your socials, you know, you do drive traffic, right? But it's also, I, I've talked to some folks who have gone on to LinkedIn and looked up different, you know, executives or curators or staffers. Some have had success getting through to them, some haven't. The other thing is there are certain tastemakers on YouTube, for example, and getting your music featured by some of those tastemakers has helped with some artists. Again, each one of these, and we, we could go over dozens of these scenarios, they're not the same for every artist. Um, I've talked to 12 different artists who have had success getting their music tested, then added, and each one has kind of a different path that they they started with, but all of them have some things in common. Number one, they have great music. Um, as Troy Carter will tell you, it's a meritocracy. It's based, it's not based on what you've done in the past. It's not based on visuals. It's based on the quality of the song. And I do believe that at the DSPs that that is true, uh, to a large degree, these playlists are based on the quality of the song, right? So if you've got a good quality song, you're doing all of the right things. You're playing live dates. You're doing interviews with press. You know, you're getting the word out there. You're driving traffic. You're, you know, these are all those basic things that we talk about that aren't going to guarantee that you're going to be in a playlist, but they increase your chances as you move down the line. Right, right. They, yeah, you've got to do all of that, and it's all got to, it, and, and it's all got to be part of your plan. I guess what I was saying is doing that doesn't, ensure you're going to get onto anybody's radar doing that can help the, the the challenge is you could do all of that you could have the best everything you could be touring and great socials and ads everywhere and you still may not come onto their radar and that's and, a good point that's the, that's the yeah. frustrate that's the frustrating part is it is you it know is. but the common thing that i heard in nashville was that it's not just the indies it's not just the you know independent artists independent labels the folks at majors the folks at major indies top managers everyone is having this issue because spotify apple music pandora these things are the new radio they're the new retail they're the new everything wrapped up in one and it's crucial that you get on some of these key playlists so people hear you and everyone is having trouble. Um, everyone has challenges trying to get onto these playlists. And again, you may be successful going down one path, but the next time you have a, a new release, that same path may not work. Right. So, it, but we're in our infancy, right? I mean, this has all been around like a week and a half, so let's not get crazy. It's developing, it's the beginning of this new music business. Um, things are going to develop. Processes will be in place. There are ways that you can plug your songs directly into, for example, Spotify system. I can go in there and put in some releases that I have coming out just directly, right? They talked about at this convention, eventually having that built into Fan Insights, um, where you can go in and check what's going on, you know, who you're you know, who your audience is, what other bands they listen to, you know, you've been in there, but you can also at some point be able to say, here are my key tracks. And these are the ones that I would like to be uh, considered for certain playlists. Right, 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 right. Yeah. You know, you, you really nailed it when you said this is infancy. I mean, you know, so many people still don't even understand streaming and Spotify and what it is. And, um, you know, these problems are being discovered as the industry grows up. And, you know, we, we had episodes where we talked about, you know, Playola, you know, the new version of Payola, you know. I can guarantee you that, you know, when Spotify was first launched, they probably didn't sit down and go, okay, now how are we going to address the problem of people 
pain to get added into playlists. Yeah. Uh, they, they have to deal with it now. So it's good to hear that the industry is standing up and saying, we got questions. How do we do this? We need this. Because that's the sort of stuff that will motivate these these digital platforms to, you know, improve, add the yeah. services, add the tools that are needed. Yeah, and you um, know, we talked about Playola, you know, when that billboard article broke. And it was really interesting, but it was a different time even then because now a lot of those user-curated playlists have been kind of pushed off to the side. And when you go to, say, Spotify, for example, it's – you know, it's Spotify curated playlists, and those are the ones that are the priority. And just like Apple Music, it's always been, you know, because you can't create, unless you're part of the curator program, which is very limited at this point, most people can't create playlists on Apple Music. So they didn't have that kind of issue. And there were people who were selling their playlists or selling placements in a key playlist. And we, we saw that about a summer ago. But I'm not saying that that doesn't go on today, but I don't think it's as prevalent uh, due to the way that Spotify now has most of the real estate with Spotify curated playlists. Right, right, right. Um, so we're about a half hour in. Let's uh, get one, maybe one more key takeaway from the convention. Well, I think the key thing was, you know, this, this convention has been around a long time. You know, I think James Donio was saying it would, he'd been there 25 years or something like that. So this has been around a while. And like I said, it was my 20th. It's gone from physical to digital download to streaming without alienating uh, independent retail, national retail. And I think that's, that's pretty good that they've done that. We had conversations with everybody there. I think that this convention is relevant. It's meaningful. And I think you should go because of not just all the great panels, like they had panels on metadata and panels on touring and panels on, you know, everything. And those are super useful. But I think some of the best conversations are the ones that you have waiting in line at the Starbucks at the hotel. When you're walking through the hallways and you see people within the industry that you know, and or maybe that you've seen in trade publications or that you've heard of, I had really great conversations there with people from Apple, Spotify, Pandora, you know, uh, SoundCloud, and then new companies that are setting up booths to tell you about um, their new products. It was, it was probably the most productive, I think, uh, convention that I had been to of that. And I just encourage any kind of DIY artists, artist managers, people who are thinking about getting in the business, um, people that are into marketing and sales, um, it's a very, very worthwhile um, week of your uh, of your life to go to that Nashville convention every year. Is it going to be, do you know, is it going to be in Nashville every year now moving yeah, forward? Yeah, I, I, th I believe that now Nashville is the home. It's yeah. going it to stay there. It used to be L.A. It used to be L.A. L.A., and it would go around. Like, they had it in D.C., they had it in Chicago right. a few years back. It would kind of move around, and now I think it's home is in Nashville. It's at the Renaissance Hotel. It's close to everything. Um, they have plenty of ballrooms. Um, this year, Alice Cooper reunited with his original band and did a performance. Um, uh, Kelly Clarkson was there. Um, it's, it's really a great place for retail, for, you know, kind of like the old guard and the new guard. It's all about music. It's not really so much about the format and the medium. We all have something in common when we go uh, to the Music Biz uh, convention. Awesome. Well, I uh, uh, appreciate the update. And uh, I'm actually excited to see that this Facebook Live with a guest feature works really nice, really slick here. Um, we're going to have to try this, you know, next time it's just the two of us. I mean, you know, we could probably yeah. do this. Every time we don't have a guest on, the two of us could do this. And we can do it when we travel easily, yeah, too. Exactly, exactly. So a uh, huge shout out to everybody who sat through this. Hope we didn't bore you to death with some of our discussions. But uh, welcome to the very first uh, Facebook Live broadcast of the music is weekly podcast yeah uh, brought to you by brought to you Hi by hotbot.com 
All right, so welcome back, everybody. Now we're on Skype. We just spent a half hour on Facebook Live. Um, that was really cool. I like that. I'm going to want to do that more and more. Um, I can't wait until they allow us to. I'm already, you know, it's like they just launched us, and I'm already like, okay, I want more than one guest. I need to have two yeah. I want to have two guests on now. Um, it also doesn't, at least it wasn't working for us on Facebook pages. We had to do it on our profile, but we can obviously share the video onto the page. Um, but that was really cool. Um, as I said, yeah. uh, the recap, that was awesome. Thank you for the recap. And, um, let's, we didn't do this last week, but let's do a, you need help with your online strategy. And this is let's sort of a, um, uh, sort of an online, this is, let's call this a, you need help. So here we go. If your WordPress website has 10 themes and 25 plugins that need to be upgraded, you need help. And what does that mean? That might not have anything to do with your online strategy, but come on, your website is core to everything you're doing online. Absolutely. And if yeah, you've got that much stuff that needs to be upgraded, you're not maintaining your website. No way. And and WordPress and we use I'm using WordPress as an example because honestly I think the last I saw 25% of the websites on the internet are built using WordPress. Um, WordPress is just like your smartphone, your laptop, your desktop. All of it has software that you have to keep upgrading because new right. features get added security patches are made, all of that type of stuff happens. So when you have 10 themes and 25 plugins that haven't been upgraded, that's every single one of those is a potential threat for somebody to hack into your website, take control, bring it down, do anything they want with it. And trust me, I'm not exaggerating by saying that. I've had clients who've had their websites hacked brought down they've been turned into spam sites um when that happens it's a lot of work and it can be very expensive to get your website back under your control because somebody hacked in and took control yeah. of it yeah it's really important i think there are a lot you want to keep things as simple as possible you're busy with your socials with your songwriting with your touring with your publicity i mean there's so many things why make more work for yourself keep everything updated and if you can't do it make sure you have a friend that can do it somebody and, that can do it you know you can, yeah. you can you can you don't have to do this every day you can do it once a month have somebody go in and take a look or you yourself do it but just once a month go in there and make sure you keep everything current because I, I honestly, there are times where WordPress will do an, a last-minute unannounced update because it's a major security patch. They mm -hmm. found a hole that could be exploited for somebody to take over websites, and they're yeah. patching it to fix it. Just like yeah. you get your iPhone upgrades and your your Apple upgrades and your Windows upgrades and all that stuff to to fix problems. That's yeah. what's going on here. And even if you don't know the platform super well, there's plenty of help on YouTube and stuff. But there's a, a friend of mine was having issues with it, and he just went on Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R. -E he found a ton of people who are experts, and he paid $5, and the guy went in and fixed everything up for him. So it doesn't have to cost you an arm and a leg, but I think it's good advice. Yeah, yeah. So just please keep please keep your websites updated and current it's for your benefit in the long run trust me all right that's yeah. it music biz weekly podcast brought to you by hypebot.com by hypebot we're out of here see you next week everyone